We are back for another podcast. And for those of you on the Blue Collar Network, uh, you know that you can find me on HVAC Reefer Guy on Gmail, or not Gmail, but Spotify and iTunes and Stitcher and Outcast or wherever you're listening to podcasts. And today is not a HVAC Blue Collar podcast, but is a history podcast about the Old West, especially about a gentleman named Mark Boardman. And Mark Boardman, if you don't know who he is, is involved in lots and lots of history as well as a pastor of a church. Uh, Mark is the features editor for True West Magazine, which means he gets to work with Bob Bozbell. How lucky is he on that? Mark will probably say indifferent. Um, <laughs> uh, the editor of the Tombstone Epitaph. He is also a pastor at Poplar Grove United Methodist Church uh, in Indiana. He lives in Indianapolis, Indiana. And if you see him on Facebook, he's everywhere on Facebook doing, uh, like on this day, it's not an official, but he, every single day, there's something going on in history and he posts photos and articles and tap links and all sorts of stuff to every single day. So if you see him on Facebook, make sure that you find Mark Boardman and that's B O A R D M A N Mark Boardman. And uh, just watch out for him on the history pages because he is everywhere. Um, we have Mark on the phone. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? Thank you, sir. So I've been watching Mark for a long time, and he's got a dynamic voice. And you had said that you had done some radio and, I think, television. You've done radio and television in your past life. But before we get to that, like, how did you end up? As Mark Borman, it's like a stupid question. How'd you end up as Mark Borman? But <laughs> how were you born and raised? And how did you end up in history? And has it been like a lifelong thing for you? Uh, the answer is more or less a lifelong, at least as long as I can remember. Uh, born and raised in Indiana in a town that's about uh, 60 miles northwest of here and some of my earliest memories are watching tv westerns with my dad you know the the great ones bonanza and wyatt earp and bat masterson and Gunsmoke and all the rest and that at least piqued my interest as i got a little bit older i started getting interested in history and began to realize, well, maybe the two are not exactly the same, the entertainment stuff versus the history. But I didn't really get into it full time until around 25 years ago um, when there had been some changes in my life. And uh, I don't know, everything sort of rushed back. And I was, I've got to start reading about this. I have to start catching up on the old Westfield. I need to to see what the truth is versus the entertainment stories, what, what's going on here. And that's so there was a, a, a bit of a gap, if you will, between the time that I was 10 or 11 years old and the time that I was uh, old, about 40. But you mentioned your father as being an influence. Yes. Can we go back to dad a little bit? Was, sure. Absolutely. What did dad do for a living? Dad was a dentist. A dentist. Huh? Uh, Dad was a dentist, but he had a he had a whole lot of interests, and uh, the old west was certainly one of those interests. Um, I don't know that he understood the history of the old west that well, but I do remember taking some trips out west and seeing places, experiencing some things. So, he, and, and he liked to tell stories, and some of those were Old West stories. He also, with his bad voice, would like to sing along with Wyatt Earp and the other theme songs. So, I really got inculcated with the whole thing when I was very young. So, Dad was really a big influence. and Oh, absolutely. And Certainly. even though uh -huh. he, was a, and he was a dentist, so he... Yep. He had a great job, and he took care of the family, and he took care of Mark, and 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 got you to where you kind of are today, because it sounds like Dad still influences you in a way. Yeah, 
yeah, he's uh, he's been gone now for about 20 years, but uh, certainly his influence is, is there present uh, every day of my life. Uh, as I get older, I think I sound more like him. I think I write more like him. Uh, I think maybe we grow up into our fathers at some point. Well, I noticed that with my dad. My dad's been gone about five years, and I'll, I'll drive in the truck, and then I look at my hands, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I got my father's hands. I've yeah. got his wrinkly yeah. arms. Like, how did this happen? Um, yeah, exactly right. And uh, it just stuns me to see that happening. So when you when you were moving up as a young man, you said that there was a gap. And for me, I had the same gap, and it was called life. It was, you know, I was traveling all the time. I was going places when I was single, and then I got married and had kids. And then all of a sudden, it came to a stop, and I'm not – sad about it because I love being a dad. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was a 20 year and all of a sudden here I am in my fifties, late forties. And then history shows up back in my life. How did it, how did it show back up in yours to where you said, Holy cow, I've, I've been missing a lot. Um, I was in uh, broadcasting for a long time i actually had started getting some interest in it when i was really little i was attracted to microphones and by the time i was in high school we had a radio station there and i got heavily involved and really thought this will be something that i will do now after getting my undergrad and graduate degrees i went into broadcasting and spent a number of years there in markets from all Cleveland, Ohio, to, to Dallas, Texas, to Washington, D.C., to a few other places. I was all over the place and had a, a pretty good level of success. Um, you know, I moved up from being an announcer, a newscaster, to being a program director, to being uh, a station manager. But... Uh, I guess I had picked up some bad things throughout my adult life that started coming to a head. <laughs> oh, but just before I got to 40. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, I was dealing with some mental illness and I was trying to cope with that with drinking and that led to some bad behaviors and that led to me losing my job and that ended up losing my career. At about that time that that was occurring, I started getting interested in the Old West again. Maybe it was an outlet, an escape, but I remember uh, a friend of mine had a catalog of the early West books. The early West folks down in Texas put out some books. They offered books for sale beyond that. And so I bought a, a, a book. Uh, a biogra- biography of John Wesley Harton by Richard Marone. And just loved it. And then I saw, you know, these people have some antiquarian books that they're selling. So I bought a first edition of John Wesley Harton's autobiography for a hundred bucks. And that pretty well hooked me. Um, plus the fact that I my career was gone. I didn't have anything else going. And... I had plenty of time, so I started doing Old West things. I started writing and researching. I started going to conferences for both WOLA and NOLA and getting involved with both of those organizations, getting to know some of the better researchers and and writers in the field. And as time went on, I became confident enough that I'd done enough reading and enough research that maybe I had something to contribute. So I, I some of my writings I started uh, I started giving to, to True West in particular because I knew Bose and uh, his his standards were very low, so he would take my stuff and actually pay me a dollar or two for them. And it went from there. Um, you know, it went from having relationships, let's say, especially with Bose and some of the folks at True West, <coughs> excuse me, to to actually being offered their job there. And I was offered a job and my first day at True West 
It was my 50th birthday. And so I've been going strong with that ever since. And it's just been multiplying various things since then, uh, including the epitaph. And I'm coming up on three years there well, as the editor of that discussion. publication. That's a whole nother part of today. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. and, and yet the two are, are linked because when they were looking for a new editor for the epitaph, Bob Love, who owns the newspaper and who owns the OK Corral, went to Bose and said, you get any ideas? And he says, you got to hire Mark. It's that simple. And that's what ended up happening. But when you got into your the history part of it in your 40s and starting mm -hmm. researching the facebook and the and social media wasn't around then no mm -hmm. not at all and computers really weren't around yet um they, well, well they, they were they, but they actually they weren't they, like they, they are today were. Uh, you know, it, it, I had first been using the internet and, um, using computers pretty heavily back in 92 in radio. And we were developing all sorts of things for programming and even playing music using computerized systems. So by the time that I got into, uh, journalism, if you will, history journalism, which would have been, you know, like I said, about when I was 50, so that was 15 years ago. Uh, there was quite a bit there. Whenever I went out to True West in, in Cave Creek, I had a computer that I could use and, you know, do whatever I needed to do. But the, the research, I was going to say, like back in your 40s, <laughs> the research and the availability of everything now, we can just type a word in a search search bar and it brings up everything that we want to see. At that time, it was a lot harder in your 40s. Everything was almost first-hand research of going to county record buildings and newspapers and microfish. And writing letters and making phone calls. And yes, absolutely. It was, it was relatively primitive, let's say, compared to what we have today. But then I got to meet people like Fred Nolan and uh, Bob DeArmond, some of the other Bob Utley people have been in this field for decades and they were telling me what it was like in the early sixties or so. And I felt, yeah, man, we've, we've got it so easy, even though the computers at that point weren't able to give us everything we wanted at the, the stroke of a button. When, when you met Bob Nolan and you met people long before me, and you, uh, that had been doing this for decades, when you met them, um, was it like a, um, like seeing a movie star moment to where you're, you're like, oh my gosh, there he is. Because I, I have to tell you, I, I, I did that with Roy B. Young last year. I, I met Roy and I sat there at Starstruck. Like I couldn't believe that was Roy Young. Roy B. Young is sitting there. And I even had my photo taken and he's like, are you okay? And I, I, oh my God, I'm standing next to you. Did you have the same when you met those people that had been dedicated their lives for a long part of their life to history research? I, I was too stupid to know. <laughs> when I, when I first started going to NOLA and WOLA, uh, I was such a novice in terms of what the field was about at that point that I didn't know. Uh, I had no idea how important some of these folks were. And when I met them at those organizational meetings, you know, they were just absolutely average, everyday Joes who would sit down at the bar with you and talk for a while and you could ask questions. And I didn't know any dip better. Uh, as I got more into the field, I was going, holy crud. Mark, did you realize who your friends were and what they've done in this field? Um, but I think for me, that helped because it allowed me to get to know these people on a one-to-one -one basis and not one to 
here's the guy up on the pedestal. And it allowed me to feel more comfortable going into the field to make my connections, to ask the stupid questions, which they didn't mind. And then to feel like, uh, based on everything they told me, that I could do those things as well. So at, at least that has been my analysis of it. it. It was better for me not to see them as they really were, but just to take him in as, as you know, another guy who was at Wola this year. Well, I, I felt the same way with everybody that I met at uh, TTR. And for those that don't know, and if you could, Mark, what does Wola the Western and, Outlaw and Lawman History Association. And then and there was also NOLA, NOLA, which was the National Outlaw and Lawman History Association. And those two organizations merged some years ago to become the Wild West History Association. And that's what you and I belong to now. Yes. Mm-hmm. There are some amazing people in the WWHA group. And I've only met five. (laughs) You've met, (laughs) you've met so many over the years is, do you have a story about one of them that is really funny that nobody would know or something that happened to you that you've kept in your, that I can, that I can tell in public. <laughs> yes, you can tell in public. Because I am going to ask you about working with Bob Bozbell. Well, you know, most of the funny stories I have are about Bob Bozbell. Um, then share those um, because I, a lot of people, including myself, we look at Bo- Marshall Trimble because I live here in Arizona. Right. Um, and Bob Bozbell, I look at them as, you know, icons in American history, Western history. <laughs> <laughs> but I know they're just two guys that, you know, you could, like you said, you go to the bar, have a beer with, and spend the afternoon yep. having a chat. Oh, yeah. But what are what is Bob Bozbell like? Is he, you know, for the people that don't know, is he the way he comes across on video? Because when I watch him on Facebook, I'm like, I'm knocking on Bob's door. We're going for a beer. I can't wait to spend an hour with this guy. That's Bob. He's, he is energetic, uh, he's funny, he's a goofball, he's knowledgeable, he is ADD, <laughs> so he's allowed to jump from subject to subject before you're ready, um, but he is, and he has the most fascinating stories, and I assume, I assume that some of those stories are true, but I don't know for sure. Well, Mr. Bozbell, if you're listening, this microphone, I would love to have you on. Um, anytime, any subject, I don't care. When, um, when you started working up the ranks to the history part of it, and you started seeing Western history differently, I would assume, than what you viewed it in the beginning off of a book, and you started to dig deep, what did you do about the people who began to become, become, armchair historians and pull pictures off of Pinterest and other sources that are not so truthful. How did that affect you or did it? Um, well, of course, when I got involved, there was no Pinterest or any of those things. Um, it, it's only been the last uh, seven or eight years, I would guess, We've seen that sort of thing. And we've seen the explosion of, look at this new Billy the Kid photo I found and and all those other things. And to be perfectly honest, for a while, too long a while, I almost took it personally. And I think there's a, a fair number of people in the field with experience and knowledge who do sort of take it seriously. The concept of, I work my tail off to find out the truth, to present it, to do so in an interesting way, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time, and you're throwing stuff out that is bogus. And you're you're undermining everything that I've done. 
And I understand that feeling. It is personal. And I've gotten, and of course, online, in social media, you can end up with people just coming after you. And I have had people come after me. Uh, and it's very, very unpleasant because they're not going to listen to what you're saying. They don't care. They have their opinion that may be based on rumor, innuendo. It may be based on a TV show. It may be based on a movie or just legend or whatever. And they're not going to change their opinion, no matter how many books you give to them, no matter matter how many sources you cite, they are not going to do it, which to me gave me a couple of options. One is I could continue the fight and have a nervous breakdown Hmm. or B to say to heck with it and move on. And I would say over the last four years, maybe five, I've gotten a lot better of just just washing my hands of it and saying, I gave you the stuff. If you don't want to accept it, that's fine. I'm off and doing something else. Well, I'll I'll tell you, um, a personal story is as I started to research more, because I'm a places person. If you ever see my content, it's about a place. Like, I'm horrible with dates. Mm-hmm. I'm horrible with numbers. I'm horrible with addresses. So I end up, and I, that's me. That's me as a person. But I'm good with places. And so I research places and then go see them and then, you know, put content to them. When I started doing that, uh, John Bosnecker would watch and he said, and he sent me a message and he said, I think you need to go to TTR. I think this will help you in doing what you need to do. And in that process, I've met some fantastic people like John, even though I've never met him because of COVID last year. But we speak on the phone. Peter Brandt is another one that I highly respect. You, Bob Bozbell, Marshall Trimble. Um, I've got a friend named Mike. I I, I, I butcher his name, Mike Mahalik. Mahachek. So, if Mike, if you're mm-hmm. listening, you know exactly who you are. Um, Nancy Sosa. And those people have helped me along the way. And I, and I remember telling John, I says, I think you picked me on purpose because John is somebody who fights for the authenticity of a photo. And it just yep. wear, it wears him out. <laughs> mm-hmm. it and, it, and it wears me out. And I told John, you picked me on purpose. Like, you, you brought me into your living hell. Um <laughs> And, and, uh, and I think it's okay because it helps me in my research. When, when you were moving forward with Bob and, and True West Magazine, how did the epitaph come along? Now you mentioned that the owner of the epitaph called Bob and I'm looking for a guy and I got a guy. Was it that simple? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, it probably was a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the essence of it. Bob Love called Bob Bozbell. Bob Bozbell said, you got to hire Mark. And then he, con- then he contacted me and said, I just recommended you for the epitaph job. I believe that Bob Love may have uh, looked at some other people as well. So it wasn't just me. There were probably some other people, and but he thought that I was the right uh, person for the job and hired me. And uh, I think it's June that it, it'll be three years. But how does that come about? A guy, were you living here in Arizona then or were you in Indiana then? I was in Indiana. So how does a guy that's in Indiana, and I get that it's connections and it's relationships, I get that. <laughs> A guy in Indiana who is cruising along through life, Bob recommends you for the epitaph job. You accept the position. How does it work out that the epitaph, I know it's physically in tombstone, but it's still a continually running paper. How does that go about? Uh, it, it is a continually operating paper, but only on a monthly basis as a history newspaper. 
So to that extent, it's not that much different than a small true west. Um, uh, and it's more manageable in a lot of respects than true west is. Uh, we don't get as much advertising, but then again, on the sales staff, um, our subscription list is smaller, although growing. Um, my predecessor as editor lived in Northern California, and he rarely got down to Tombstone. So it's not as if this is something entirely unique or new. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just, you know, I'm a little bit further away and farther east, but, uh, it really works out pretty well. If I can get out to Tombstone a couple times a year, then that's nice. I can do some stuff, but otherwise I'm dealing with a lot of the same people that I've dealt with for years in terms of, of articles in particular. Um, people that I've known through first Wola and Nola and then WWHA and TTR, uh, they're the same people I work with on these articles. So that has not been a difficult point whatsoever. If anything, my, my associations, my friends, my colleagues, that's made it a lot simpler to do the job. When, when you accepted the position, in fact, let's do this. If somebody is interested in getting your newspaper, uh, how would they contact you? How would they sign up? Is there a website? Yes, there is. It is Tombstone Epitaph, one word, two, with two E's right there, tombstoneepitaph.com. And how do you spell epitaph? Is that E-P- E-P-I-T-A-P-H, epitaph. C-H. P-H. P-H, there you go. I was like, phonically, I'm missing something. Right, no, P-H. So if they went to tombstoneepitaph.com, they would be able to find all sorts of history and a spot there to subscribe. And you guys can subscribe. For the of you listening, it's a great period. I don't get it. I'm, I'll sign up for it. But yes, you will, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up right now. I, I promise, Mr. Boardman. I promise. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're doing this paper, and... And I made the mistake, and I even sent Mark a message, and I said, Mark, I, I'm in Tombstone, and I go to Tombstone quite a bit, um, more than I should, but I like it there. But mm-hmm. I go to Tombstone quite a bit, and the, I went recently, and I went into the epitaph, and I looked around, and I said, well, where's Mark? Like, I kept waiting for you to pop out behind a door. And they're like, well, he doesn't publish here. Is the epitaph in Tombstone left as a reminder or does the epitaph and tombstone generally generate business, or is it just being part of tombstone history? Yes, all the above. And do you have uh, any? It, do you have anything to generate, do with it? It does generate some subscriptions and some sales. Mm-hmm. Um, there is cross promotion between the OK Corral and the epitaph. It is a museum that includes the original printing press that John Clum brought down to Tombstone to do that first issue, which today being May 1st, uh, this is our anniversary on May 1st, 1880. And so it's a lot of different things all packaged into one. But, I, it, you know, frankly, and I've been going to Tombstone now for 20 some years, I couldn't see tombstone without the epitaph in a lot of respects it has played such an important role in this town since 1880 including Hal Dorado basically the the print the publisher and the newspaper ramrodded the first Hal Dorado in 1929 and a lot of different things since then it's been very very important so I think it's an important role in the city now, even if it's not a daily newspaper. So in all your research with the newspaper, all your personal research, all of your places that you have visited in time, over time, do you have a favorite or something or a, or a, a story 
that you researched that to this day you hold above all others from Western history where you find it so fascinating you just can't put this one thing down? Um, yes. It's actually a couple of stories, but they influenced my viewpoint on Old West history to a huge extent. Um, when I went to a WOLA conference, in fact, I was the president of WOLA at the time in southern Utah, and this would have been maybe 16, 17 years ago. Um, we had as a guest a man who must have been in his uh, mid to late 30s, and his son, who was 11 or 12, the son was a Boy Scout and was working on a Boy Scout project. And the father told his family story. His great grandfather was a lawman in Salt Lake County, Utah. And it's sort of a long story, but uh, one day, a miner by the name of Red Lopez killed another man over a woman in the mines just outside of Salt Lake. And he goes out and starts running in the snow. He's not dressed for the snow, but he's running through the snow with a rifle. They send out a small posse of four men after him. He gets to a cabin a few miles away, hides behind a snowbank, and as they get close enough, he opens fire on them. Kills three of them, one shot each to the head. He's an expert shot. And the fourth only escaped because the bullet was a dud. Red ends up killing two more lawmen and escapes and is killed years later by Frank Hamer along the, the Mexican border. But one of the men killed in in that uh, that shootout that they had, it really wasn't a shootout, they were just gunned down, um, was the great-grandfather of this man that I was talking with. Oh, wow. And he said, what most people don't know is what happened to our family after that. And I said, of course not, no. Um, he said they had two sons, and they were going to bring up the sons, and they were going to go to college and you know, be better off than the parents and the whole bit. But when great-granddad was killed, there was no money coming in. They had to sell their house. Uh, there was no life insurance. The boys had to go to work. They had to move away. Um, great-grandma was reduced to, to doing laundry and sewing and basic stuff like that and just barely making a living. The two boys who were going to go to college didn't get anywhere. They didn't even finish high school, not even close. And their children, the same thing. They were just scrambling to make a living. And the next generation, the same thing. Until this young man, like I say, was in his 30s. I said, did you go to college? He said, no. I graduated from high school, which is better than most of the folks in the family, but I I didn't make it. He said, but my son, he will. It'll be a hundred years after the fact, but by golly, he's going to go to college. And he did, by the way. He graduated from college. But he said, that's what happens after these gunfights. That's what happens after somebody gets gunned down. It's not like the story is over. The story is just beginning for a lot of people. And once I heard that story, I got an entirely different view on violence in the Old West and how it impacted people. And I started looking behind the initial stories of just the violence to what happened to people that were surrounding it, what happened to them, and what happened to their children and their grandchildren. And it's scary. Families were destroyed, absolutely destroyed destroyed for generations and that's pretty sobering so when i see a gunfight on a tv show or a movie yeah it's sort of entertaining but back in my mind there is 
somebody else is going to pay a price for this, and they're going to pay a big price for this. It's like a cascade effect. It, just, it is. It just continues on, and it doesn't stop. And people don't think about an action, that an action creates another reaction, and it just continues. And it, Amazing it does. Story. Uh, I, I found another story. I, interestingly, I, I came across another family. They contacted me. Uh, they were descendants of um, a man who owned a bank in Colorado. And one day, the McCarty gang came into town to rob the bank. Uh, Fred McCarty, the youngest one, was like 19. It was his first robbery. He was nervous and something happened. And he accidentally shot and killed the guy. Fred and his father, Bill, were gunned down by another man as they were trying to get out of town. But this man, um, his name was Blatchley, had, I think it was eight sons, and a ninth one was on the way. Had a nice farm of a couple hundred acres outside of town. Um, and again, there's no life insurance. There's no nothing. And the wife had to take, uh, the wife miscarried the next day over the, the shock of it all. But the wife, who had been born in China to a missionary family, was just sharp as all get out. She got herself together. She sold off the farm and bought a smaller one that they could use for subsistence. She shepherded the boys out to get jobs that would be appropriate for each one. And she said, our plans were for all of you to go to college and you're all going to go to college. You may be in your 40s by the time you go, but you're going to go. And when the first one had enough money to go to college, then he graduated, he got a job, and he funneled 50% of his money back home so the next one could go and the next one and wouldn't you know that all eight of those men went to college hmm. not all graduated but all of them ended up being humongous successes in life and would that have happened if their father hadn't been shot down that way i don't know it might have been a different story in some ways i'm sure it would have been but uh, in, that was an amazing story too and it, again, was a cascading effect of what the violence had brought about. So the stories that you're talking about end up with great endings. And your life, though, continued on into a new chapter and you became a pastor. How did that come about? How did you become a pastor of a church of all things? Um, I remarried 15 and a half years ago to, uh, <laughs> to a lady that I'd been in high school band with. And we found each other again many, many years after the fact. And we decided that one of the things we wanted to do was uh, walk a faith path. We wanted to go to church together. And when we came to this area outside of Indianapolis, we did that. And we got involved in church and committees and Bible study and the whole bit. And as we did, um, we recognized that there was a fulfillment that we were getting that we'd not had before. I went on a weekend retreat with men and had a couple of experiences and sort of wondered, hmm, am I being called to ministry? Now, before this, I'd done a couple sermons. And I'm comfortable speaking in public. And it was about the Old West, by the way. <laughs> and I dressed up in hat and boots and the whole bit. But I wondered, hmm, am I getting a calling in this direction? So I thought about it. I prayed upon it. I just waited to see what might happen for a couple of months. And the more I considered it, the more I was getting affirmations that this was the road I was supposed to go on. I mean, it was just really crazy. People coming up to me in different situations. Are you a pastor? 
No, no, I'm not. But maybe I'm supposed to be. And it it finally came to the point where I needed to go talk to my pastor, my mentor at church. And I walked in the door to her office and she took one look to look at me and said, you've been called to be a pastor, haven't you? Hmm. Well, I guess that takes care of that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I started in the process of becoming a pastor. Before I finished the process, uh, I got a church, the church that I've been at ever since. And instead of it blowing up in my face, we just found each other. I love them so much. And but I it, guess they love me, me too. Let me ask you, though, to hold on. And, yep. Let me ask you, because some people would say it's fate. Some people, like myself, would say it's God's plan. When you were going through the pastor process, how did the church come about? Because the church you are the pastor at in Poplar Grove is a small congregation. Yep. And it's not one that a giant networking system would say, you know, Mark, we have we have a spot for you at a super church of 5,000 and, you know, huge networking opportunities. Poplar Grove, I don't see as a networking opportunity. How did that come about that you ended up in such a cool small town with such a great but small congregation? My pastor, Pastor Karen, um, had a lot of contacts. She, uh, she had been a pastor for about 20 years, uh, had come to it when she was 50. And, but she was, she knew everybody, including our district superintendent, including our conference bishop, and she introduced them to me. So I had contacts that maybe a lot of people who are going through the process to become a local pastor didn't have. And they saw that I had some talent. Uh, they saw me preach a couple of times and felt that I had strengths. When I, when I, I, I just gotten done with chaplaincy training essentially, over the local hospital here, which was an amazing experience. And I wasn't sure what was going to come next. Well, the previous pastor at Poplar Grove left. There was uh, some difficulties. The congregation split. And they needed to get somebody in there fast to try and salvage things, to just have somebody there on Sunday to preach. And the district superintendent called my pastor first and said, hey, I think this will work for Mark. Do you think I should call him? And she said, call him right now. Mm -hmm. And he did and explained it to me. And uh, I said, okay. And this was a Wednesday. And I said, when do you want me to start? He said, Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went, okay. I don't have any idea where this place is. Mm -hmm. um, but... We did start on Sunday. <clears throat> this church was split. There were a lot of people who had left, many of whom came back eventually. Um, it was a learning experience for me because I had mostly been in larger churches, not anything this small. And I found the beauties of being in a small church, especially with these particular individuals. So, it was supposed to be a six-week temporary period. Mm -hmm. and then they were going to bring somebody in and put them in the, the job. And eight weeks went by, and ten weeks went by, and twelve weeks went by, and I haven't heard anything. So I finally called up the district superintendent and said, uh, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but what's going on? He said, oh, we decided to leave you in there. Things are going really well, so... You just stay there. Okay. I can do that. And it was only after that that I finished up the classwork, etc., that I needed to become a local pastor. Do you, now that you're an established pastor, do you find any correlation 
between where you're at in faith or where your church is at in faith. And it may be a stretch. And if it is, you can say, Mike, you're, you're full of crap. Do you find any correlation between where you are as a pastor, your leadership in a pastor, or as a pastor, the direction of your church and the American West? Is it like in values or were the values different? Or do you say, you know, Mark, I did so well at this one. I could have been a pastor in the 1880s. Is there any correlation? I think the, a lot of things have changed, at least within the Methodist Church. If I were trying to do this in the 1870s or so, I'd probably be a circuit rider and ride from church to church to church and, you know, get around the circuit once every few weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's entirely different. Um, it took years into the 20th century for those to more or less go away once transportation uh, evolved, once roads were improved, etc., uh, so it's different in that respect. And I don't envy those preachers who had to try and take on five churches but only see a congregation once every five weeks. Wow. Uh, that would be tough. Mm -hmm. Very, very tough. Uh, in terms of values, I would hope that some of them would be the same. Um, I don't think the message of Christ has changed a bit. Our interpretation, our view of it probably has. Um, but I'd like to think that this concept of loving other people, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, is, is something that is universal in terms of time and space. Uh, I know it's not, but I'd like to think it would be. Um, so... Uh, and, and certainly in a place like Poplar Grove, where the main part of our building was constructed in 1860. It's a beautiful And we, we've got a cemetery oh, on three sides, and mm. there are graves that go back 20 years before that. Mm. Uh, matter of fact, I found something really that I didn't know existed until last week. There's a Confederate soldier buried there. Uh, with the, the Maltese cross and everything on the stone, I'm going, what is he doing in here? But um, there are some of the people who are in our church can go out and see great, great grandpa because mm -hmm. he's buried right out there. There are traditions in that respect. Many of our families have been part of our church for generations. Many of them have intermarried. Uh, most of them have known each other for decades. Uh, so that means there is a continuity, uh, not only in terms of the people and the families, but I think in terms of some of the values, some of the beliefs. Um, I think it has changed probably in that now I would hope and pray that we would be more accepting of different people mm -hmm. if they were to walk in the door right. than they might have been 50 years ago or 100 years ago right. and the, where they might have been just cast out mm -hmm. immediately. But, you know, it's a, you get the backwater Indiana, it's a pretty homogeneous group of people. Right. It's mostly white folks, mm -hmm. blue-collar folks. Um, there you who, go. Increasingly, we have college-educated folks, but that wouldn't have been uh, common two, three generations ago. So we're we're slowly coming up on fifty minutes. It goes by fast. Yes, it does. When first off, and so we know where to find you on the again. Where would we find you on the epitaph? That would be www tombstone epitaph. Dot com, two E's, right. Tombstone Epitaph, PH at the end, yep. dot com. And yep. if they wanted to find you on through your church and listen to your devotionals, which you do daily, um, or a sermon topic. Actually, I don't. I, I do them a couple of times 
a week at this point. Oh, okay. <laughs> right now, right now, it's best to find me on my Facebook page, Mark Boydman, or at the Poplar Grove page. Poplar Grove. Uh, that's P O P. Yeah, that's P O P L A R. P O P L A R Grove. Poplar Grove. Right. Right. And you know, we're hoping that we'll be able to expand it over to YouTube and our web page and that sort of thing, but that's in the process of right now. Is there something that you live by? And we spoke about it yesterday and or the other day, I think it was yesterday. We spoke about what do you live by? For me, I live by do the right thing and risk the consequences. Um, some people will say, well, what does that mean? I'm like, well, you could do the right thing and be fired from a job. Or you could be do the right thing and risk a friendship. For me, I'm willing to risk those things as long as I'm doing the right thing. What do you live by? What is Mark Borman? What does drives Mark Borman besides the church? Do you have something that you uh, maybe dad said or grandpa said or somebody that you met or Bob Bozbell said that you live by? Uh, it still comes down to the great commandment for me. Increasingly over the last 10 years, that's, that's where I find my inspiration and my guidance and my motivation that I'm to love God with everything that I've got. And, oh, by the way, love other people as you love yourself. There you go. Uh, it, it all comes down to that. Um, if I can't do those things, then I need to sit down and have a good talk with myself and with God. Sounds good to me. So for those, again, that are listening, this is Mark Boardman. And Mark Boardman is everywhere on social media. Uh, you can find him at the tombstoneepitaph.com. You can find him on Facebook at Mark Boardman and also research Poplar Grove. Um, like we said earlier in the podcast, he is also, um, he is also the features editor at Tomb, at Tombstone at True West Magazine. <laughs> And so you can find True West Magazine um, at Magazine Racks near you or online. Uh, I definitely recommend a subscription. I got my subscription. It shows up. And the, the articles and the pictures are phenomenal. Um, you can find Mark, like I said, just about everywhere. And especially if you're a history person, you want to connect with Mark somewhere um, on the Legends of the Old West or Tombstone Territory Rendezvous or wherever to get his daily updates um, about history on this date. And is there anything else you wanted to add? Did I did I miss anything that we can find you? Can we find you at Target on in the men's department? Like you have your own line of clothing or your own line of shoes? No, but I, I suspect once things change, I'll be over at Walmart greeting you and giving you a card. So, uh, really, <laughs> I'm why not? Oh my god, I would, else. I would totally do that. I would go in, I'd grab the cart, I'd walk in, I'd push <laughs> the cart back, I'd walk back out the exit, I'd come back in the inside and just to see you again, and then I'd push that cart back inside, I'd go out the exit, I'd make a big circle to the point that you're like, come through here again, and I'm punching you. Um, exactly. <laughs> And, uh, and you can really find Mark everywhere. And, and I'm really blessed and I'm happy that he agreed to the podcast. And I'm hoping he'll say yes if we want to do another one. Sure. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, um, and again, I appreciate you guys. And so for me, um, you know, do the right thing and risk the consequences. And of course, every podcast ends the same. Please, there is so much craziness going on in the world. Reach out to people around you. You could have neighbors, loved ones, family members, church friends, church family, coworkers that are struggling and you see them struggling. Reach out a hand, reach out an arm, give them a big hug, tell them that you're thinking about them, spend some time, take them to lunch, take them to dinner, do whatever, because they definitely need you and you'll find out that you definitely need them. And it makes the world a lot smaller and makes the world a better place when you reach out to people that need help. Uh, for me, if you want to get a hold of me, 
Uh, you can do so at HVACReferGuy at gmail.com. That's H-V-A-C-R-E-F-E-R-Guy, G-U-I at gmail.com. And I will answer all your emails. And if you can't get a hold of Mark for any reason, you can email me and I'll connect you with Mark. I want to thank uh, the Tombstone Epitaph for letting Mark be here today, or not letting, but uh, for their support, because Mark's time is valuable, and I appreciate him a bunch. And you can find him at tombstoneepitaph.com. Uh, I want to thank my blue-collar supporters that take care of me, and that is SEPCO, and uh, Sealed Unit Parts, and Solder Weld, and Interplay Learning, uh, Navac pumps, and this is all for the air conditioning people in case they're like, ooh, what is all this? They're the air conditioning side of keeping people cool and they support me. And, and, and I want to thank, uh, who else do I got to thank? Interplay, uh, cool air products. And, um, gosh darn, I'm trying to think who the other ones are. There's a bunch of them out there. And I just want to thank them. Oh, and Choice Refrigerants. I want to thank Choice Refrigerants. They're out of Alfreda, Georgia. They're just good folks making some great refrigerant. And the reason I say all of that is, is because we have a, a, our charity this year is St. Mary's Food Bank in Phoenix. For every dollar you donate, it creates seven meals or feeds seven people. So if you give 20, you know, $20, that's 140 bucks or 140 people that are fed. It's, and if I'm wrong on the math, that's why I do air conditioning. But um, just reach out to a food bank near you, $5, $10, $20, $100, whatever you can give. There are so many people that need help because of COVID and they just need help in life. In general, reach out to a food bank near you and give them a hand. As always, thank you, Mark. I appreciate you a bunch for being here. And I appreciate all of you. Uh, 